And now it's time for our webinar. Today's speaker is Dale Wade. Dale has been involved in prescribed fire and forest management research for more than 40 years. He spent most of his career as a fire behavior scientist, team and project leader at the U.S. Forest Service Southern Research Station. Dale is a charter member of the International Association of Wildland Fire, the Longleaf Alliance, and the Georgia Prescribed Fire Council. He has served as an instructor for federal and state training courses, has received numerous honors and awards for his work over the years, and has over 140 publications. Since retiring in 2002, Dale has continued to be involved in the fire community through his consulting work. We are very excited to have Dale share his knowledge and experience with us here today. And I'd like to mention that he's also been working with the Southern Fire Exchange to develop a set of five fact sheets that provide details on some of the topics he'll be discussing. And those will be available on the Southern Fire Exchange website within the next few days. And with that, I will go ahead and hand the microphone over to you, Dale. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dale Wade. As usual, I'm trying to cram about 10 pounds of facts in a five pound sack. So we're going to go pretty fast through some of these because I'd like to have some questions and answers at the end. But if I don't get to answer your questions, please email me and I'll be happy to take the time to answer until we get both of us on the same page. I just like to start with this overview. I'll just let you read it for a few seconds and then I'll just switch over. I'm sure a lot of you have worked with or worked for folks that say they advocate fire but just never seem to get around to using it. Uh, I don't have much use for those folks. Just to get everybody on the same page, if you're living any place in the United States, you probably are living where there's historically been a lot of fire. The sea green over here on the East Coast, you're historically burned with low severity fires at least once every 35 years. The regular green, same thing except they call them stand replacement fires and that's simply because a lot of those are grasslands and we're burning off the top of the grass, so we're calling it a stand replacement. But there used to be a lot of fire here, and there still is quite a bit of fire, actually. As you can imagine, most of these species are fire adapted, even those that we don't normally can think about as fire adapted, such as cypress, which you're seeing here. No mistake, fire is the ecological imperative. If you don't have fire in an appropriate regime, your ecosystem is going to suffer. There are no long-term surrogates, although, of course, we can do some things that temporarily help, like chemicals or mechanical. And rest assured, if it's a fire-adapted ecosystem, it will burn. It's either going to burn when you want it to or when somebody else decides. And your land is going to reflect the fire regime that you have on it. And it's going to determine how it looks and what kind of critters it's going to attract. And fire is not a one-time thing, as most of you know. Benefits are many, but they're all temporary. But most of your objectives can be achieved if you're using fire every one to four years. Now, if you're on a severe southerly slope, really poor site, a lot of Virginia pine or something like that, uh, you're not going to have enough fuel to burn every one or four years. But on decent sites, one to four years pretty well covers the range you ought to be thinking about. And remember, no matter where you think you are in your professional development, we all started at the same place, and that's not knowing much. 
The way I learned was I took every opportunity I could to burn with others, and I drove folks crazy by asking questions and more questions. You need to talk to folks at your local state fire management office. You need to find out what their website has to offer. You need to take part in the fire council, whichever one is closest to you. And before you get started, if you're not sure what you want, look at other ownerships in the area. See what you like and what you don't like. And you don't have to tell the folks whether you like them or not, but chat with them and see what kind of fire program they're using. Then you want to make sure that every prescription that you write for your fire on your lands promotes your management goals. And you need to make sure that you follow all federal, state, and local statutes, regulations, and rules. And of course, policy comes in there too. I strongly recommend that you take certified burning training. If your state does not offer it, look at the joining states and see if there's one that offers it. And I would suggest that you pick the one that lasts the longest because it'll be well worth your time. And once you get some experience, you'll be able to look at a slide like this or actually a fire like this, and you'll know that a fire in this three-year-old slash plantation is not killing those trees. At least the backfire is not. If you were to put a head fire through here, you would probably get bud damage, and you probably would kill a lot of those trees unless they were longleaf, and if it was longleaf, I would always opt to use a head fire. And we'll see a little of that later. It's kind of a no-brainer, but you need to make, you need to know what's on your land. Walk them frequently and keep written notes. Uh, one of the things that I've learned over the years is my memory is not anywhere near what I think it is. So what I'd like what I always do is establish a couple of photo points and just take photos before you burn, a few during the fire, and then I take them annually. And I usually take them at the end of the growing season. And when I'm writing my plan, I don't want to limit the days that I have to burn, which means I'm going to put really wide ranges on all of the weather parameters I use. For example, relative humidity, I'll probably go from 35 to 60 on just about every burn. And on temperature, I'll probably go somewhere between freezing and the 80, just about every burn. You also want to vary the season and the weather conditions between your burns. I didn't put frequency in there because there probably will be some years when you don't get it burned anyway, and that'll kind of take care of itself. You might have some exotics that come into your property, and they can cause real problems, especially if they burn well. Uh, the photo you're looking at here happens to be Kogan grass, and that's a fire that's backing. And you can see it's it'll give you big eyes. If you've got an exotic and you're not sure what it is, or any plant that you're not sure what it is, your county extension agent should be able to help you. And they probably can also give you an idea about how you can control things. I personally like to save snags. I think they're aesthetically pleasing, and uh, I just like them. But I do not like them when they're close to the fire line, because if they ignite, you're going to have constant source of embers that could blow over the fire line. Not good. So I like to try to save them. And what I try to do is before I burn the regular unit, I'll go in and I'll burn out around those snags around 30 feet. And I'll take a person with a torch and one with a backpack pump, or maybe two, or an ATV if I can get in there with an ATV. And I'll Try to fireproof around that snag. Uh, in the picture you're seeing, there's probably no way you're going to keep that from burning. Uh, 
if you've got a piece of heavy equipment you can get in there, you can perhaps pull on the binds and get them off, but otherwise you probably ought to write that one off. If you've got T and E species on your property, and T and E, I mean threatened and endangered, uh, you need to make sure that you don't do anything to harm them. If you're in the south and you've got RCW, a red cockaded woodpecker, you may find that you've got white bands on some trees in your property that you didn't put there. Uh, or maybe you knew they were there. But those are cavity trees for a red cockaded woodpecker. And they are very likely to catch on fire when you burn because the woodpeckers nest in live trees and they keep pecking around their holes so they can generate a lot of sap flow to keep snakes from coming up and getting into the nest. And of course, as most of you know, pine resin burns well, so you've got a problem. These folks, I think, are taking a chance. It's probably about a two or three year rough and doesn't appear as though they've done any pre-burning work here. What I like to do is go in the day before or the morning before I start and burn out around them and at least 15 feet and just make sure that you've got them fireproofed. Whatever you do, don't put a piece of equipment in there and try to clear the brush out around with a tractor plow or a grater or a dozer or anything or even with a rake, you're just going to expose all those tree roots and you're asking for more trouble in my estimation. Just to show that even though fire, even though most species in the south are very fire adapted, some are also fire sensitive. And that means you've got to get the timing down pretty close or you're not going to favor them. And one of those happens to be switch, both species of cane actually, both giant cane and switch cane. Uh, you can sure burn it every year or every two years, but if you really want it to do well, you ought to try burning it every three to six years. Generally, if you're into aesthetics, I recommend that you burn every year or two. That's the way you're going to maximize it because you're going to get a herbaceous ground cover. You're going to find that if you've got a mixed pine hardwood stand, you probably aren't going to have enough fuel to carry fire during the growing season to burn every year. And don't worry much about your dogwood. Dogwood leaves are really high in calcium, which is a fire retardant. So if you've got a low intensity fire, it's likely to go out right at the drip line around the dogwood. And I've been burning in dogwood for a long time and I've still got a lot of them there. This is just to show you what a seat looks like. It's actually the transition zone in the south between the swamp and the hill. And uh, hill's a relative term. I recognize that. but. Uh, with frequent fire, that's what it looks like. If you don't use frequent fire, what happens is everything in the swamp starts marching uphill and creates an awful lot of competition and your seep has disappeared. The way you restore those is to run a fairly intense head fire downhill into the swamp and you force those species back into the wet area. You do want to make sure when you do that, though, that the swamp is not dry. Otherwise, you're likely to have a problem. When you're planning, it's a lot easier to plan winter burns than it is to plan summer burns because you can watch the weather coming across the US. And you can figure out when it's going to reach you and how much rain is going to be associated with that cold front that comes across. You burn during the growing season, and you don't know whether you're going to be able to burn today or not until you get out to the site and see if it rained last night. And the only, the best way to tell, I, at least the way I 
do it is I just stick an empty can out on the site, not underneath canopy, but out in the open. And I'm out there at daybreak and I'm looking in the can. If there's no water in it, today's a good burn day. If there is water in it, I'll probably look at another area to see if that got rain and maybe if it didn't, I can burn that area today. I try to conduct my growing season burns within the first couple of months after green up because we still get some occasional cold fronts and we still get some wind and I like wind because it gives me direction, it keeps me in control of the fire. If I wait till midsummer, then I've got two problems. My winds are generally light and variable uh, and that's okay if you can use grid technician ignition or spot fire as long as you've got some wind blowing. And of course, if you have any topography at all, then you can use your slope and takes the place of wind. And we also have the problem of lightning in the summer. And I like to get my growing season burns finished before about two in the afternoon and the lightning storms kick up. Uh, one thing you don't want is to have a lightning storm come across your burn. It's going to spread your fire in a several different directions and likely rain it out, which means you'll be back sometime later trying to finish up the burn. But do remember, temperatures are higher during the summer, and so you've got some heat stress issues that you might have with your crew. Another reason that I like burning in the growing season is that I generally don't get 100% black because I've got green fuels out there. There's, there's nothing wrong with 100% black except that it means there's fewer places for little critters to tough it out during the burn. And during the growing season, you're probably going to have a little bit of water in your depressions, and it gives folks, uh, animal folks, a place to go and survive. And it also tends, I think, your summer fires are a little safer. They don't have quite the intensity because you've got more moisture out there and more green fuels. Uh, of course, you also if you've got more moisture, you've got more smoke. I don't talk much about smoke in this presentation because in another month or two, they're going to do a series on smoke, and I'll be giving another webinar on smoke at that time. Just to give you some idea what you can do with fire, I've often heard that you need summer fires or growing season fires to create a herbaceous component and, um, you know, baloney. This happens to be down in South Carolina on the Flatwoods, but you can see 12 annual burns, and we took a pretty nasty looking stand and converted it pretty much to herbaceous understory. So if that's your goal, you need to burn fairly regularly. One thing you need to be thinking about, too, is promoting species. And if you want to increase them, if you burn during the growing season, you're going to influence flowering. Some species will do better if you burn early in the growing season, and some if you burn later in the growing season. And this Keep looking at what you've got after fires and changing the time that you burn, and pretty soon you'll figure out if you, for example, want to increase muley grass, you're going to burn in the early spring. Uh, this happens to be down on the coast of Plain in Georgia. Uh, on the left, an annual growing season burn, and on the right, a three year burning regime. And you can see there's a big difference, and you can figure out if you were in fire control where you'd rather be fighting fire. You also, in my estimation, have a lot better habitat for most wildlife on that annual than you do in the triannual. You're always going to have some spots that don't burn, and a lot of animals and small critters and birds, etc., do like a fairly dense understory where they can have a safe zone, but most all of them will feed out there in that open area. And I 
think uh, in general we have a lack of open areas rather than a lack of dense areas. And just to show you, we can burn pretty often in hardwood without undue damage. This happens to be an oak hickory stand up in the Cumberland Plateau in Tennessee. And that's after 10 annual spring burns. And those burns were just before green up. And uh, you can see there's some pretty small stems that are surviving there after 10 fires. I tend to use, I tend to like to use head fires and stand like this, uh, low intensity head fires, of course. And head fires are maybe not what you would intuitively think, but head fires are cooler near the ground, and we'll talk about that in a second. So they're less likely to damage your stems. I do not like to put in hard plow lines. However, if you need to, you need to. But just remember that you've got a lot of small critters that are going to find that an insurmountable barrier. I'd much rather, if I can, put in a disc line, and that way you can actually drive it with an ATV. But I'd rather not use a hard line at all. I'd rather use a soft line, an ecotone, power line right away, a creek mode line, hiking trail, wildlife trail, you name it. And basically, if I can walk it, I can ignite it, and I can have somebody with water following me to make sure we've got a wet line so it won't go the wrong way. And I also suggest you have somebody follow up behind you 100 feet or so just to make sure it's dead out. Water makes an awful good fire break, but if you've got vegetation such as the Spartina uh, and you've got wind, head fire will carry right across that water and you'll say, holy camole, I didn't think that happened. Best thing to do is to back your fires into those wet areas and just let them go out near the water's edge. Uh, that way you don't have to put a plow line in. It's just, I, just a lot easier on the ecosystem. Here's an example where we had a fire and it went out down as it went down toward that drainage. Uh, you have to be careful, though. that your Keech Fire Room Index, that's a drought index, uh, isn't too high. I wouldn't try this once it got up around 450 or so. Because uh, if it does cross that drainage, you're going to get some consumption in the duff and you're going to get some root mortality and that's not what you're asking for. Uh, what you do want to monitor as well to make sure that you don't have a real problem here. Uh, this just shows you the Keech Byram Index and it is my first toggle switch if I'm trying to make a go no go decision on a given burning day. Uh, when it gets up around 450, I think about postponing burning, especially if I've got a duff layer present. If I'm down in well-maintained southern pine that I've been burning every one or two years, I tend to use 550 as a cutoff. Actually, you could burn when it's a lot higher than that. But the problem is, if you have a problem and you need to call your friendly state agency to come put out a spot fire or an escape, they're likely to be tied up on another fire and their response to you may not be very timely. And also, of course, the higher the Keech fire room, the less water you're going to have in any depressions and that means the fewer safe zones for small critters. If your state does not calculate the Keech fire room drought index, you can do so yourself, but I suspect uh, you can either email me and I can tell you how to get there, or you can probably go to the Southern Fire Exchange and site, and they probably have it already up there. And Keech Fire and Drought Index is very site-specific, so you want to know the location of the weather station where that number's been calculated so you can mentally adjust either up or down to your location. A lot of times... 
you're going to be, especially if you're in co-op forestry or research, you're going to be asked to go off maybe as a consultant as well. Somebody's going to decide they want to use fire on their lands, and they haven't had fire on there in the last 15 or 20 years. That can create some real problems. When your forest floor gets around three inches thick or so, I'm not going to burn when the keech fire is much above 200 because I don't want any of that duff catching fire. Most of your, especially on sands, your trees are going to send feeding roots up into that duff layer because that's where the nutrient exchange has taken place. And you're likely to end up with an awful lot of dead roots. And if you've got 200-year-old trees like this loblolly pine here and you damage a few of the feeder roots, you've probably killed the tree because it's on a pretty thin tightrope between transpiration, respiration, and photosynthesis just trying to maintain itself. Obviously, if you burn when it's drier, you're going to burn more of your down dead material. Uh, that's not necessarily bad. You don't want to consume it all, and you can see there's some left in here. But in a healthy ecosystem, you're going to get large branches coming down uh, pretty regularly. You're going to get lightning strikes putting things on the ground, and you're going to get some trees just dying because they can't make it. It's just suppressed and they finally give up the ghost. And of course, uh, while that large material is burning, you are creating smoke and it's probably mostly residual smoke and won't be entrained into the convection column. So you need to be careful where it's going when it leaves your site. It's a no-brainer that Things aren't static, and fuel accumulates over time. Uh, the picture on the bottom just shows you how rapidly it can do. Uh, this happens to be a fairly decent long-leaf slash pine site, and in 12 years, you have a pretty impressive depth of litter fuel there. As a rule of thumb, when I'm dealing with southern pine, and including any branch material less than three inches in diameter, you can figure you're accumulating about two tons an acre per year. And so if you've got about 20 years, you're going to have around 10 or 15 tons at least on that area. The reason you don't have 40 tons is that you do have decomposition as well. And eventually you're going to reach an equilibrium, and we'll talk about that in a second here. After a hurricane, or if you've got a lot of southern pine beetle damage and low down dead trees on the ground, you're going to have to add at least 10 tons and maybe another 20 or 30 tons to the fuel on the ground. This is a busy slide, but what you need to take, take a look at is the basal area goes down the left. For those of you that aren't familiar with basal area, it's just cross-section of the trees that are on an acre. If it's 30, uh, it's pretty sparse looking. If it's 200, it's really thick. And across the top, age of rough, and that's actually age since the last disruption and in the south it's often fire, you'll notice that at the end of 15 years with really dense stands, we've got about 12 tons of total fuel on the forest floor. That's not as much as most folks would think. You'll also notice that we reached equilibrium because at age 10, we also had about 12 tons so if you're in the deep south, you're going to reach equilibrium fairly quickly. If this was slash pine, you'd be talking about roughly 18 to 20 tons 
per acre at the end of 15 years with a thick basal area. But it's not the total amount of fuel it's got, it's what's available that counts. And what's available depends on the ignition technique you use and on the weather that you select to burn under. You'll notice on the right that that's a it's a pretty good fast moving head fire, but you'll also notice that it's not consuming a lot of those gallberry stems. So your consumption is not anywhere near as high as you might think that it's going to be. And consumption is what EPA is worried about because they're worried about the nasty byproducts we put in the air. I have found over the years that a good average figure for prescribed fires is about two and a half tons per acre consumed. And that's a lot less than EPA wants to tell us, and it's a lot less than some folks think. A good, well, how do you have a good average wildfire? A lot of wildfires in the south uh, burn in heavier roughs. And once your rough gets up about five years or so, you ought to think that you're going to have about 10 tons an acre that are consumed. If you get down into a wetland forest, and uh, such as a swamp, for example, if that dries during a drought, you're going to have a lot more consumption down there. And we're not talking organic soil necessarily. We're just talking a lot more consumption of everything and you're probably talking at least five to 10 tons an acre in those swamps. And that also goes for pocosins. You burn a lot more fuel in pocosins. If you're burning in open areas, such as marsh or pasture land or something like that, your available fuel is probably going to pretty closely equal your total fuel. And if you've got a good marsh ecosystem, sawgrass of Spartina, uh, you're talking 15 to 20 tons an acre sometimes. You definitely want to invest in a some kind of a weather kit. Uh, this is the old style. Uh, if you were to buy this weather kit and they're still for sale, the first thing you want to do is you want to throw away that Beaufort wind gauge. It's useless in prescribed burning. It's got a threshold of about two miles an hour when it's new and it deteriorates after that. And when you're burning in a stand, all you need is enough wind to give that fire direction. A uh, mile an hour is plenty. A lot of these new gadgets you can get, uh, you can stick them in your pocket. And they work fine as far as the temperature goes. And as far as the wind goes, you want to make sure that you don't stand in front of that wind device when you're trying to measure the wind. Hold it out to the side so you're not blocking the wind. And the quality control on their relative humidity sensors is lacking at best. So when I get one, I always try to test it against the sling psychrometer to make sure that it's going to be accurate. And if it's not, I just waste the money on that little pocket weather kit because it's not going to do what I want it to do. And when you get it, use it. On site, First thing you're going to do on the day you're planning to burn is make sure that conditions you've got match what the forecast says you're going to have or supposed to have. And if it doesn't, you need to get a hold of your, if you're lucky enough to have a forestry meteorologist working for their fire control agency, email or call him and ask him what's going on, and he can help you. And then use it during the fire occasionally, and write these results down. 
on your burn plan. You'll find that RH really is controlling an awful lot of your fire behavior, especially your spotting. I suspect every one of you has stood around the campfire at night and watched all those embers go up from that fire. Same thing happens during the day, you just don't see them. And they're landing downwind, and once that reddish humidity gets below about 35%, the number of ignitions from those firebrands goes up dramatically, and once it's down around 20 to 25%, you're getting almost 100% ignition from every firebrand that drops downwind. Conversely, once the RH rises above around 60%, your backfires are not going to carry well. Um, that's okay as long as you're burning at least 60 to 70% of the area, but you don't want a really, really patchy burn. And that's true, especially if you've got hardwood litter. In good pine litter, sometimes you can burn with the RH up around 75 or 80 percent. And of course, as your Keech Fire Index goes up, you're going to find that the fire is going to burn much better. One of the things you find is how do I determine relative humidity? It's not in the newspaper, it's not on television, and it may or may not be part of your radio, probably isn't part of your radio, it may or may not be part of your forecast in the morning, wherever you get it. Easy way, a good rule of thumb, every 20 degree change in temperature is either going to decrease or increase the RH by half or, 100, or increase it by doubling it. And here's just a quick example. Uh, in the south, anywhere in the east, you ought to assume that you're going to have 100% in the morning unless you had a cold front pull by the day before. And you are going to know what the temperature is. So we're going to assume that the radio told you the temperature was 40 degrees out, and you probably have a thermometer that tells you that as well. And assume you've got 100% RH. If the expected high for the day is 80 degrees, you can tell what the minimum RH will be. Uh, you go from 40 degrees to 60 degrees, that's your 20 degree raise, and you're going to cut the RH in half from 150, and then go from 60 to 80. You're going to cut the RH in half again, which brings you down to 25%, uh, a level that I would be very leery about burning on if I've got anything downwind that's likely to catch. And then as you go into the late afternoon and your temperature starts to cool, you'll notice here we went from 80 to 70. So instead of a 20 degree, we only had a 10 degree rise. So if it was 20 degrees, you'd go from 25 to 50. But since it was only 10 degrees, you split the difference between 25 and 50, and that's 37.5% or 38%. And that, you can take that rule of thumb to the bank unless you're near the coast and you have a sea breeze come in, because then you've changed your air mass and all bets are out as far as this rule is concerned. Another problem you have is figuring out what your in-stand winds are. Your forecast is giving you a wind speed, but those winds are at 20 feet or 30 feet in the air, depending on whether it's a state or a federal wind vane that's giving you the numbers. And what you want to know is what is the wind speed that is going to be pushing your fire? And we usually talk about four and a half feet or dBH diameter or wind speed at breast height, which is about four and a half feet off the ground. So I've got uh, these rules of thumb that, that I use, and they work pretty well. If you're in dense pole-sized timber or if you've got a, 
understory that's over five feet high, you're not getting much wind in there at all. You're lucky if you've got a tenth of the wind. If you've got a fully stocked stand, and for those of you that don't know quite what that means, uh, just visualize a stand that, that you think has about the right number of trees on and that you're happy with. And if it's got a closed canopy and the end of the story is less than five feet, uh, your wind is about a quarter of what it is in the open. If you're burning an open long leaf, I figure it's about half. And if you're in a large open area like a marsh or a prairie, uh, it's probably just about whatever the 20 foot is. One thing you're going to find is that if your unit has some rights of way or roads, or paths, whatever, going across it, when your wind is blowing perpendicular to those, you're going to get eddies forming, as you can see by the yellow lines in here. And if you're on the upwind side, which is the left-hand side as you're looking at it, you're likely to have scorch right along that road because those eddies are pushing the fire up, as you can see from the arrows. Uh, you go in at 50 or 100 feet, and you get no scorch, and your fire uh, is doing exactly what you want. But right next to everybody who's traveling, they're saying, oh, my gosh, he did a lousy job. Uh, same thing happens if the wind is running parallel with those rights of way or roads. You're going to get all kinds of little eddies that are on either side, and you're likely to get scorch. Uh, no matter which side you're burning, if the wind is running parallel. And you also have to be a little careful because it's going to be a lot faster because your wind will channel as it goes down there. So your wind speeds are going to be higher than you might think. Another thing that you need to really pay attention to is your fuel moisture. And there's no, there's only one accurate way to determine fuel moisture, and that's put it in an oven and dry it. And obviously, that doesn't work operationally because you don't have the answer until it's too late. So there's a couple of things you can do. I use the SNAP test, which works really well in long-needled southern pine, such as longleaf, loblolly, and slash. You take a one of the needles off of the forest floor, off the top, and don't want get one that just fell, but get one that's been there for a while, and make a loop out of it and pull it tight. If the needle breaks as you're picking it up, it's way too dry. If you can pull it tight without it snapping, it's too wet. Uh, we used to say if it breaks when that loop is about a half inch and a half inch between the top and the bottom, that's just about perfect. I invested in a lumber probe a long time ago, and it really works well. Uh, you can buy these on most forestry supplier sites. And basically, they're meant to take the moisture content of lumber that you might be putting in a house or whatever. But they work just as well in the, in the woods. What you do is you just grab a clump of needles off the forest floor. Don't dig. Just kind of rake off the top. Wad it up pretty good and stick the probe in there. And make sure you're wearing a glove so you don't stick it in your hand. And it'll give you a fairly good reading, uh, I think consistent and accurate. But I also always check with my hands anyway on the forest floor. And I want to make sure that the top of the litter layer is fairly dry. And generally, the bottom is wet. You typically want a pretty steep forest floor moisture gradient from the top to the bottom. Dispersion index is actually a smoke forecast tool, but it is also a pretty good indicator of fire behavior. Um, it is probably, well, let's see how, I'll, I'll it's a good tool to use. Not all states 
use this. Some of them use the ventilation factor, which is a lot less robust, and I don't like it, but if that's what you've got, then that's what you've got. But if you're using the dispersion index, anything above 40 is going to probably give you adequate smoke dispersion. Now, obviously, if you've got some really heavy fuels blow down, or if you're igniting, and if you're igniting these fuels really fast, you're going to want greater than 40. And the higher it is, the better smoke dispersion you're going to get. The problem is, the better fire behavior you're going to get, or the more, more interesting fire behavior you're going to get. And so when it gets up around 65 or so, I start thinking about, am I going to be able to hold this fire down at the downwind end? And do I really want to burn today? If I'm burning small blocks, and I mean less than five acres, and light fuels like uh, one or two year rough or pasture or something, and I've got no smoke sensitive areas within a quarter mile or so, I probably, if my agency will let me or if my boss will let me, I would burn with a dispersion index somewhere around 20 or so. If it gets below 20, I probably wouldn't do it. Just remember, when you light the fire, it's yours. It's your responsibility. And if you've got a problem, you're the one that's going to have to explain why you did what you did. A lot of states you can still burn at night. And I actually like to burn at night, although there are smoke problems, uh, many more smoke problems at night. And you can also get a dispersion reading for night. It's calculated differently, however, and if you've got a dispersion index anywhere near 7 or 8, you'd better go for it because that's about as good as it's going to get. Another thing you might have noticed is if you're burning and the temperature is below freezing, your fires may not be doing what you expect them to do. The reason is once the temperature gets around 29 degrees or lower, the water in the live cells is freezing, just like it does in your orange groves. So in order to get that water out of those fuels so they'll ignite, first you have to melt the ice. And that takes a lot of extra heat to do. And the more heat that you expend melting ice and getting rid of water means the less you have to preheat those fuels to ignition temperature. So when you're burning on a real cold day, and there's nothing wrong with doing that, just be aware that your fire is not going to behave anywhere near with the vigor that it does when the temperature is up above freezing. Crown scorch is something we all worry about, and it is unsightly. And if you're burning in species like white pine or your hardwoods, where they only have one flush a year, and that's in the spring, and you kill the foliage, well, then that tree has to tough it out until the following year before it's going to refoliate, and a lot of them won't make it. Southern pine, however, has multiple flushes. And that's one of the things that's probably evolved over time because it allows these trees to survive in a really fire adapted environment. So even if you get 100% crown scorch, any time from about February on to the beginning of August, you're going to get new foliage appearing within a week or so, and your trees are going to survive. That's as long as you do not have any, and I mean any, bud damage. If you get bud damage, even 
Uh, if you get roughly 25% blood damage, you're looking at roughly 75% mortality in young, healthy southern pine. So you do not want blood damage. But you can scorch them up pretty good. And if you scorch them up any more than around 30% or so, you're likely going to get some growth loss. And that's for flash pine and loblolly pine and shortleaf pine. Uh, you all need to take me to the woodshed because I never did get around to really looking at it in longleaf pine. My guess is that longleaf can take a lot more scorch without any growth loss. However, even with your southern pines, if you burn in the early fall, well, any time in the fall, and you get anywhere near 100% crown scorch, you're likely to kill those trees. Much more likely to kill those than other trees. The reason is that trees with multiple flushes stay fairly active all year long. So they don't store a lot of reserves, carbohydrates in the root systems. And so if all of a sudden you take away that ability and they've got to tough it out for four or five months without any photosynthesis taking place, a lot of them die and the rest are really stressed and you're likely to attract all kinds of predators that uh, come in and feed on those trees and finish up the job for you. Here's a longleaf pine stand. Some folks might think that that fire was too intense. Uh, it certainly was an intense fire. I don't like them quite that hot. Uh, but it's longleaf pine, and you'll notice it's candling. All those trees have survived. You've thermally pruned the lower branches, which is good. And you've eradicated hardwoods down there. And generally, that's also good if you're... Dale, this is Bob. It's... Uh Coming on 2 o'clock right now, so uh, we'll growth. need to wrap things up. Uh, ah, you can, I am you almost keep going. there. I just want to, you to be aware of the time, and so, I see you only have a few How would you like to do now, that, so Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, if you get a piece of fuel that only contains so much energy, uh, you can burn it with a head fire or a back fire, and that's all it's going to give off. So, and that flame uh, energy is pretty evenly distributed along the flame. So if you've got a head fire with longer flames, it means you're distributing some of that energy further higher up. Uh, whereas if you've got a back fire, it's all concentrated right at the base, which means that you're going to do a better job of killing your hardwoods, top killing them. You don't necessarily want to eradicate them. You just want to put them back on the ground and let them sprout, as you're seeing here. And here's a wax myrtle. Head fire would not have killed that. Backfire did. And you can see down there that it's re-sprouting. Uh, I don't know how many times I've heard folks say, that road will hold it, hmm, but it didn't. Always black line, every time, whether you need it or not. Uh, here's for you folks that rely on plowed brakes. That's a plowed fire line, and that's a two-year rough in Palmetto Galbury, and that's the flame going right across it. Pay attention to what you've been igniting. Learn from your mistakes. It's too late to solve a problem on this, but learn from it. If you're burning with the sea breeze, Sea breeze doesn't come in at a steady rate. It vacillates back and forth. Make sure it's established, otherwise you're likely to have a situ situation like this. Um, hot head fire and young longleaf, those trees are going to survive. Um, and that's the way a lot of folks like to burn their longleaf. Here's one where they release the longleaf. You'll note that it killed the loblolly pine that was coming in. But you see that the longleaf pine is still candling. So always be thinking, what if? The unexpected is going to happen. Here we have an initial backfire in the slash pine. That's about a minute later. 
thinking what if before that happened, uh, it isn't going to make the damage any less probably, but at least you'll have a better idea what you're going to do. I finished, Bob. We'll open it to questions. Great. Thank you, Dale, for a great presentation. For those of you who joined us during the webinar, we just finished up with a presentation by Dale Wade, who is a consultant and retired U.S. Forest Service scientist. And my name is Annie Oxerart, and I work with the Southern Fire Exchange. And given uh, that we are about out of time for the day, I think we're going to um, ask you to email questions to Dale, if that's OK with you, Dale. Um, and then you can finish up your conversations offline um, that way. And I'll go yeah. ahead and put his email here into the chat box um, so that you can all just copy it from there and put it into your email. OK. It should also be on the, well, it's not on the screen now, I guess. Uh, but I, I do encourage you folks to email me. I'll be glad to carry on a extended conversations if you'd like. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us today. We hope that this webinar will be useful in your fire management and research programs. And if you'd like to hear about more webinars or programs from the Southern Fire Exchange, you can join our email list or follow our social media accounts.